What a powerful song to open up this missions conference that will be running for the next four weeks, beginning this morning. Uh, we're so excited that you're here to be a part of it. Take your Bibles, turn with me to Luke chapter 12. As you turn there, I just want to highlight a couple of things to you. One thing that we're doing during the missions conference is we're making available to you uh, some mission trips that will be happening here from the church, a series of them, about four that we have planned. And we have a brochure. I won't go into all the details, but it looks like this. It says Go and Tell, which is the theme of our conference for this uh, particular month. And you can go by the info desk, all the locations in the commons, the V1 Reach booth, and you can pick one of these up and begin to pray about God calling you, you stepping in to his call with a yes to go and to serve somewhere around the world. We have trips right here in the U.S., we have trips abroad, but we really want to begin to make this a, a, a new rhythm of lifestyle for us in this post-COVID reality of which we're a part to get you deployed out there with your hands, your feet, your prayers, your efforts to touch the world. So pick one of these up and let God lead you. Also, just want to let you know that we have a missions banquet coming up Thursday, and we need you to sign up. Uh, many of you may not know what this is about. I just want to tell you it's a time of information and inspiration and a time together with a meal. That's it. We just want to begin to talk to you and to display to you some of the things that we're most passionate about, the things that God's doing around the world, and we want you to sign up. The cost is only $10. You can go to the homepage and sign up. You can go to the info desk. But please, before you leave today, sign up. We have spots available, but we need your participation. So go by and sign up before before you leave today. Also, just want to let you know that Serve Day is coming up on March 11th. You can go to the B1 Reach booth uh, today and sign up. Uh, you can sign up for an individual project. If you have equipment that you can lend to us, we'd be very grateful for that. You can talk to the folks at the booth and they will help you to get connected with all that. One other thing, we have special services coming in the next couple of weeks. Some of the greatest mission speakers in the world will be here. We don't have a lot of outside guests, but you will want to be here the next couple of weeks to hear from God, to hear about what God is doing around the world, and we want you to make plans to be here. Well, took, look with me, please, to Luke chapter 12. I want to begin reading in verse 42 as we open up this missions conference. And the Lord said, Who then is that faithful and wise steward whom his master will make ruler over his household to give them their portion of food in due season? Blessed is that servant whom his master will find doing, so doing when he comes. Truly I say to you that he will make him ruler over all that he has. But if that servant says in his heart, my master is delaying his coming and begins to beat the male and female servants and to eat and drink and be drunk, the master of that servant will come on a day when he is not looking for him and at an hour when he's not aware and will cut him in two and appoint him his portion with the unbelievers. And that servant who knew his master's will and did not prepare himself or do according to his will shall be beaten with many stripes. Everybody say many stripes. But he who did not know yet committed things deserving of stripes shall be beaten with few. Everybody say few stripes. For everyone to whom much is given, from him much more will be required. And to whom much has been committed, of him they will ask the more. Father, this morning I'm going to thank you, Lord, for all that you've entrusted to us. Thank you for all you've committed to us. God, we are so blessed. We are so abundantly blessed. Lord, it's almost embarrassing in a lot of the rest of the world. And I pray, God, that you'll help us to understand and accept that great responsibility that we have, Lord, with this gospel, that God, you will speak to us in a unique way, Lord, to inspire our hearts, to begin to call us into deeper depths of commitment, Lord, with our life and resources over the next three or four weeks, that God, you will open us up, that we may be uh, receptive, that we may be fertile ground for you to plant new seed in. And so, Father, we thank you today for all that you're going to do. Anoint me, Lord, as I preach this message. In Jesus' name I pray, and everyone said... Amen. This morning, I want to open this missions conference of 2023 with a message entitled An Unequal Gospel. An Unequal Gospel. I don't have to tell you this, but we live in an extremely divided world. We are reminded of this at every turn. If you turn on the news, if you go into the workplace, you feel the tension and divide that exists right now in our world. And I would submit to you that our world has always been divided. It's a product of human nature. We're not all going to see things the same way. However, I want to tell you that we're living in a time right now that exploits the differences between us as perhaps no other time. As we think about this time that we're living in, I would suggest to you that we're living in a 50-year historical cycle of divide. I want you to think back to the years between 1968 and 1973. Many of you were not here. I wasn't here, but for the tail end of that, I was born in 73. Don't hate me because I'm young and pretty. Please don't, don't hate me. Huh? But think about that time. If you're a student of history, think about all the things that happened from 68 to 73. 
There were the Democratic, there's a Democratic convention in Chicago where the riots erupted. There were the Kent State shootings. There was the civil rights movement, the Vietnam War, the assassination of Robert Kennedy, later the assassination of Martin Luther King Jr. We saw the Watergate scandal and then the resignation of Richard Nixon. It was a very divisive time in our nation. And I would tell you, it's at least my observation, that the spirit of rage was much more overt 50 years ago. And now 55 years later in 2023, it's, it's subtle, it's nuanced, it's more sophisticated. And if you listen to the talking points of the talking heads, there is a poisonous rhetoric that is igniting a growing frustration that it could explode at any time. And we've seen it explode a couple of times over the last few years in some very ugly, ugly ways. And there's a growing divide also among races and among religions and among social classes. And these divides and differences are pitted against one another so that one segment of society can gain an advantage over the other. Without question, as we think globally this morning and touching the entire world in this missions conference, the animosity that exists between those who live in the third world countries and the first world of which we live is the disparity that exists in our prosperity. Man, this nation has been blessed like nothing that's ever been seen and known in the history of humanity. The, the United States of America has been blessed beyond measure. Can I tell you why we've been blessed? It's because we have been a country that has sent the gospel of Jesus Christ all around the world. And in the same way that America has been blessed by seeing the gospel around the world, if you want your life to be blessed, just get involved with seeing the gospel all around the world. That's what this missions conference is all about. Because God will honor those who come beside him in this great commission that he has given us. In America, we have become conditioned, I think largely through media, to despise a group of people called the one percenters. How many of you ever heard of the one percenters? The one percenters. Nobody. Okay, well, okay, I'm up here alone dying this morning. Thank you, folks. Thank you. Well, I'll explain who they are. They are the, the group that's the wealthiest segment of society in the United States of America and in the world. And I want to read to you an article, and I'm going to take parts of it slowly so we absorb all that it's trying to say. It's from a 2012 edition of Forbes that helps us to understand the one percenters. And I quote, before you can talk about the 1%, it's important to put the figures into perspective by understanding exactly what the figures means. The annual income of the top 1% in America is $717,000 per year, compared to the average income of the rest of the population, which is $51,000 per year. The real disparity between the classes isn't in income, however, but in net worth. The 1% are worth, on average, about $8.4 million, or 70 times that of the lower classes. The 1% are executives, doctors, lawyers, politicians, among many other things. Within this group of people is an even smaller and wealthier subset of people, the 1% of the 1%. Those people have incomes of over $27 million per year, or roughly 540 times the national average income. Altogether, the top 1% control 43% of the wealth in the nation. The next 4% control an additional 29% of the nation. It's historically common for a powerful minority to control a majority of finances, but Americans haven't seen a disparity like this since before the Great Depression, and it's only getting larger. So you say, Pastor, okay, thanks. Appreciate it. Appreciate you pointing out the fact that we're divided. We know that. We know there's one percent. There's a lot of wealthy people in the world. So what's the point? Well, as I survey this crowd this morning, I'm looking for one percenters. You say, Pastor Mark. <laughs> the only one percenter we've got in this place is Mike Robertson. <laughs> and folks, I'm leaning on him as hard as I can. You see, there's no one percenters here, man. We're, we're just average middle class people. I, I want to ask you, are you sure? You see, you think I'm coming looking for financial one percenters. I'm coming to look for kingdom one percenters. In our theme passage taken from Luke 12, Jesus is giving us a parable about wise and evil servants. When we use phrases like evil, we get the idea of these servants poisoning people or raping people or killing people. But 
In this context, if you read the passage and you read it close, an evil servant is simply someone who neglects their responsibilities. Ow, that, that, that gets a little closer to me this morning. I would never consider myself an evil person, but in the context of this passage, if I'm a servant of God and I'm neglecting my responsibilities, Jesus says that that behavior is evil. So what can be so evil about the servants of this passage? Well, the great evil of this passage is that these servants stop looking for the return of their master or boss. The master or the boss, he'd gone away out of town on a business trip, didn't tell him when he was going to be coming back, and these folks stopped looking for him. They stopped anticipating his return. When they lost the sense of urgency for the return of their boss, the passage indicates that they began to behave badly. They started getting into physical altercations, beating each other up. We see that they became careless in their daily existence. They neglected their daily duties. The Bible says they got drunk. In other words, they became evil because they lived for themselves and for no one else. You see, that gets a little closer to me this morning as well. As Americans, we believe that it's our constitutionally protected right to live only for ourselves. We have lived selfishly the American dream. And because of that, it's become the American nightmare because we've accumulated more than we ever have in our life and we're still not happy, we're still empty, we're still not content. In fact, all of us know how easy it is to take our foot off the gas, to coast through life, to live with no thought of anyone else except ourselves. And that doesn't seem to be such an awful thing. I mean, what can be so bad of getting mine and living for me and watching out for number one. Yet from Jesus' perspective, he says, that's evil. That's evil. In fact, he says that if we who know his will and who know him do not prepare and do not perform his will, we are subject to judgment. Oh, pastor, don't say stuff like that. That's, that's old-fashioned. That's old-timey. Well, it's also biblical. The phrase that is used is that we would be beaten with many stripes. And you repeated back to me those words, many stripes. By contrast, those who did evil things but did not know the Lord's will will be beaten with few stripes. And you repeated back to me, few stripes. Why is this true? Look at verse 48. For everyone to whom much is given, from him much more will be required. And to whom much has been committed, of him they will ask the more. So if you've been given a lot, Jesus expects a lot. If you've been given little, then Jesus expects less. So today I resume my search for the spiritual 1%. In fact, as I look out over this crowd this morning, I see the 1% of the 1% in the kingdom of God. You say, well, why, why, why would you think that I'm the spiritually elite? I mean, I, I, why would you think that I have those things? Uh, maybe you're a new believer. You're saying, Pastor, I don't even get what you're talking about this morning. Well, let me just ask you some questions. How many churches are there in Visalia? I counted them this week. I tried. 120. How many Bibles do you have in your home? I have 17. Just me. I'm not counting Gretchen's. 17. I've got Bibles in Spanish. I've got Bibles in Hindi. I've got Bibles in Portuguese. I've got Bibles in Greek. Folks, I can barely speak English. I don't even know what's in these Bibles. I've got the King James. I've got the New King James. I've got the New American Standard. I've got the Message. I've got the Amplified. And I've got dozens more on my computer. How many sermons have you heard? Some of you are saying one too many after this morning. (laughs) Well, let me just say this to you. As a preacher, I have over 2,000 sermons in my files. Hard copy, paper, 2,000. Boxes, boxes in a closet at home, Gretchen can verify. Many more on the hard drive of my computer. And I've heard thousands more. Folks, I listened to six sermons this week. Six sermons. How many Christian radio stations are there in the Central Valley? Several. How many Christian TV stations do you have at home? Let me help you. If you have direct TV or dish, you have 16. And you can span the theological spectrum in 45 seconds or less. You can go from the late Dr. D. James Kennedy to Jimmy Swagger and stop up at Hillsong in between, all in 45 seconds. And you'll be as thoroughly confused as a gnat and a yo-yo. (laughs) 
How many Christian websites are there out there for you to explore? Millions. How many Christian books do you have in your library? At one time, I had over 3,800. So without question, we are the 1% of the 1% of the spiritually elite. We have more gospel access than anybody else in the world. There are people who would literally give their life or have their life at risk just to sit in a service like this this morning to hear the gospel in many, many, many sectors of the world. No other nation, no other generation has ever had more gospel saturation than those of us who are here today. We have been force-fed the gospel. Folks, we've been waterboarded the gospel. Yet for people who have so much, hang on, we've done so little with it. I wonder what Jesus thinks from his perspective in heaven as we've been so gospel saturated what the return on investment has been for him. Because we take and we take and we consume and we consume and we consume. But what do we ever do with it? I've often wondered how it's fair that I have 17 Bibles in my library and hundreds more by way of computer when pastors in the underground church in China literally have only a few pages from the New Testament by which they memorize completely to preach to underground churches that are larger than this one today. How is that fair? I've wondered how it's fair, how I have thousands of messages and heard thousands of messages when the majority of the world has never heard one. The basic problem that many people have with the 1% in the financial sense, and you hear this a lot on television, is that they would just take a portion of what they have and use it for good, then the world would be a better place. Haven't we heard that? And in response to this, men like Bill Gates and Warren Buffett, men who have never publicly said that they're believers in Jesus Christ, have made a wealth commitment to give 90% of their accumulated wealth back to philanthropic causes around the world to make the world a better place. And I find that so ironic this morning when the majority of Christians won't even give 10% of their income in a tithe that God requires and many have never given a cent to spread missions throughout the world. If you're mad at me right now, email Mike Robertson <laughs> at VisaliaFirst.com. You say, why are you talking like this? Folks, listen, I'm just talking about this because we've been given so much. How much more do we want? How much more do we need financially, spiritually? And yet, what are we to do with this? What is our response? What does God require? What is obedience in this sense? Jesus made it clear when he, that when we shirk our responsibilities, it makes us evil. The passage I read for you is a part of a much larger narrative in Luke chapter 12. And just before Jesus dealt with the parable of the wise and evil servants, he dealt with how his children should relate with the resources of their life. So I want you to look up in the, in the scripture a little bit higher today to Luke 12. And I want to read to you verses 29 and 34 because they set the stage for the previous theme passage I read for you. Here's what the Bible says, Luke 12, 29. And do not seek what you should eat or what you should drink, nor have an anxious mind. For all these things the nations of the world seek after, and your Father knows that you need these things. But seek the kingdom of God, and all these things will be added to you. That's the blessing part. Do not fear, little flock, for it is your Father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. I want you to notice this. Here's our response. Sell what you have and give alms. Notice this phrase. Provide yourselves money bags which do not grow old. A treasure in the heavens that does not fail, where no thief approaches nor moth destroys. For where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. Our sole reason for being is not to be the spiritual 1%. But it is to take what we have and who we are and to share it with the world. Because, folks, the truth of the matter is we have a very unequal gospel. 
A gospel where we have every access point imaginable for us, and yet the rest of the world, much of the world has no gospel access at all. So how do we overcome that? Well, we take what we have and we take who we are and we give it away so the gospel of the kingdom will be preached in all the world for a witness and then the end will come. That's what, we, what our responsibility is. That's what Jesus said we should do. The great sin of this passage is that the servants became evil because they lived only for themselves. The reason why is because they lost a sense of urgency for the return of their master. I'm going to take responsibility for this because I've done it for many years myself. But when's the last time you heard a sermon on the coming of the Lord? See, I, I got to a point where I stopped preaching it. You, you want to know why? Because I got tired of Christians sending me hateful emails arguing about whatever theory or philosophy that I said. Now, Pastor Jason, he preached on a Wednesday night, but not all of you got the benefit of hearing that. Because people love to argue over these things. It's become more of a spiritual sport than it has been an actual discussion. As it relates to the coming of the Lord, and you ask me, Pastor Mark, what do you believe? Here's what I believe. I believe I'm on the welcoming committee, not the scheduling committee. So when he gets here, I'm going. I just don't know exactly how all that's going to work out. But I, I've told you a little bit about my upbringing, how I was raised in a very, very strict spiritual environment conservative, assembly God church, holiness leanings in a small rural eastern Oklahoma town with one stoplight. And so in our church, we heard about three sermons. Now we, they preached on a lot more, but it always landed on these three topics, if you know what I mean. Maybe you've gone to this church. My, my church preached three things all the time, prayer, hell, and the coming of the Lord. They preached prayer strong, hell hot, and Jesus coming soon. That's what I heard growing up. Folks, I just want you to know, they preached it so conservatively, so strict. You know that passage that says there were two in the field and one were left? In my church, we preached it two in the field and both were left. That's how strict it was. <laughs> two grinding at the mill, one taking one left. Folks, that's liberal. Both of them were left. <laughs> two laying in the bed. I don't even have to explain it to you. If they're in the bed, they're goners. They're gone. They're left. And the crazy part is we seem excited about it. Man, we are shouting amen and hallelujah and praise the Lord. And it's like we're excited we're all going to hell. <laughs> we were conservative and mad about it. But I'm going to tell you, growing up in that church, I watched that movie, A Thief in the Night. How many of you ever seen A Thief in the Night? I've seen it so many times I got PTSD. <laughs> Every now and again, I'd have flashbacks of that guy with a mustache chasing after me. I just... In my church, they bring in these huge prophecy seminars and they, they build these big charts and they literally, well, this is a good-sized building and it would run from literally one side of our platform all the way across and there's images of the, the Antichrist and the promiscuous woman of Babylon. I won't say her biblical name. And there would be things and vials and bowls and trumpets and mystical language and beasts and I just, I, I, I'd go home from those things. I couldn't even sleep at night. Folks, I'm old enough to have been around when they wrote the book, 88 Reasons Why Jesus is Coming in 1988. I can tell you that on September 19th, 1988, when he was supposed to have come, I got real close to Jesus that day. I mean, I had to come to Jesus and got spiritual and I got, I got prayed and I want to make sure I was, I was ready to go on September 17th, 1988. And I tell you all these things because growing up in that church, they told me that a lot of things were going to happen and take place before Jesus came back. Again, the great sin of this passage is that people lost a sense of urgency about Jesus coming back. And it made them evil. And it made them live for themselves and selfish. But they told me all those years ago there'd be a revival in the Middle East. I said, a revival in the Middle East? Those folks aren't going to get saved. They blow things up. They kill people. They do all these. No, they said there's going to be a revival in the Middle East. Folks, I can't reveal the guy's name, but I'm in a close relationship with a missionary that in just the area surrounding the Middle East there in the, the biblical lands of the Bible, in the last six years, over 500,000 Muslims have given their heart to Jesus. Amen. I know missionaries that over a 30-year career gave away 500 Bibles 
over 30 years than the last seven have given out over 500,000. Can, can I tell you right now that in the Middle East, and I, I'm, I'm, I'm talking cryptically because if I, if I don't handle this right, people could lose their lives. In fact, in this movement that I'm referring to, 63 people have been martyred over the last seven years. But literally right now, we have over 100,000 people studying for ministry in this part of the world through the Assemblies of God, 100,000. They told me it would happen. And now right now, and most of us don't even know this until I told you, it's happening right now. Everybody say right now. Amen. What's been happening, Jesus has been showing up in visions, using his Arabic name. He says, I am Isa, who you have crucified. He would lay his hands on them, heal some of them, make a claim for their life. Many of these le the leaders of terrorist organizations that if I called their names, you would know exactly because they're on the news all the time. Those very leaders have been falling down beside their bedside after the dream, giving their hearts to Jesus, and then becoming preachers of the gospel. Folks, this isn't science fiction. This isn't preacher talk. This isn't evangelistic speaking. This is actual fact. I just can't tell you who these people are because people would lose their lives. Do you know where Christianity is growing at a rate faster than any other place in the world? Iran. Remember them? Islamic Revolution held our people hostage back in the 1980s. Jimmy Carter to Ronald Reagan, all that span. It's in Iran right now where there is more people getting saved at a faster rate than any other place in the world. The Assemblies of God has a Bible college dedicated to Iran that operates in Turkey to prepare people for ministry because of what God's doing in that nation. You realize that over the last four years, that perhaps more Bibles have been smuggled into North Korea than any other time over the last 50. Because God is at, moving, at, at work and on the move in that country, and I can't even talk about that either, but I want to tell you the Assemblies of God has already prepared a Bible with Pentecostal study notes for the moment in which North Korea opens up because at that point there's already a move of God taking place by which we believe the entire nation will come to know Jesus. How is this happening? Why is this happening? Because Jesus is coming back. Yeah. As the musicians come, and Marco, you can begin to play when you arrive. Here's what I want to tell you. If you're wondering the method to our madness, why are we raising up a, a Bible college with, with as much effort as we can possibly put into it and trying to raise money all over America to get kids out debt free to respond to the gospel? It's because Jesus is coming back. If you want to know why I'm get, taking a month to talk about missions and bring to you the, some of the greatest mission speakers in the world to inspire your heart to give over and above what you're already giving, I'm asking that because Jesus is coming back. Anything that you commit over and above your regular giving during the course of this month, it does not go to Vasilia first. It goes to push this gospel out to the four corners of the world. And folks, I want to tell you something. If you're needing blessing, be a part of this. But I will say this to you, whether God never does another thing for you in your life, you need to do it anyway. That's right, amen. Tell you one story, then I'm closing. Years ago, I was 29, 30 years old and going through a relocation project to take our little church from an acre and a half of land to 40 acres of land from a, a little 8,000, 9,000 square foot building to a 30,000 square foot building. And so I, I constructed this deal with God. I said, God, in the middle of raising millions of dollars to build this building, I will build 25 churches in the Amazon for you. And if, you, if I build 25 churches in the Amazon for you, will you take care of us, allow us to get this building built, allow us to pay our bills? That's the deal I made with God. And we did it. We built 25 churches. But let me tell you how quickly I had to repent. You see, that was all about me. That was all about what I wanted. I went to the first church dedication in a little village called Colonel Lalesha. It was named after a military officer outside of Manaus, Brazil. Largest leper colony, active leper colony in the world. Around 12,000 people who lived there, no church, nobody had been willing to go in because everybody in that village either had leprosy, have leprosy, your mom, your dad had leprosy, your grandparents. I walked in that first service, there were people with limbs missing. 
I don't mean to be crude, but leprosy had literally rotted out the eyes of people where only the pupils themselves existed in, in the sockets. I'm talking about it, it's horrific. Folks, it's, it, was, it was bizarre, it was scary, it was, I, I, I didn't want to touch anything, I didn't want to, I, I was afraid. And I got up and preached a terrible message that night and 53 people got saved, Amen. 53. Why? Because there was spiritual hunger. Nobody ever come there. And so I walked out of that building. They formed a tunnel to clap for us, to hug us. And I got over my fear of whatever could happen to me. I hugged every one of them. That comes as a great surprise to all of you. I hugged every one of them. I got in the car and I sat in the back seat and the driver began to drive away. I put my head in my hands and I wept. And I said, God, if, if we go bankrupt from this building program, I don't care if you give us a cent, Lord. This is my spiritual responsibility. I got to keep planting churches in places like this. It's not about me, Lord. It's about you. It's not about my kingdom. It's about your kingdom. God, forgive me for being so selfish as to try to concoct a deal with you for you to do something for me. God, I'm going to do whatever it takes to get this gospel out to people just like this. So here's what I would say. Let God speak to you over the next four weeks. You do what God tells you to do. And when you do, God will bless you. But don't make it about you. Make it about a world that is lost and needs him, that is desperate for the gospel of Jesus Christ. Why? Because you are the spiritual 1% of the 1% and God requires much more from you. Father, this morning, we thank you today that we are recipients of the gospel. Thank you, Lord, that we can hear the gospel preached, that we have access to anything we want gospel-related in order to be a blessing to the entire world. So, Father, thank you for all, already what you've done for us. All the things that you've done for us, Lord, we don't deserve another thing. But, God, we take what we have and we lend it to you and we give it to you so that people might be saved this world might be reached, that this gospel of the kingdom we preach in all the world for a witness so that the end can and will come. Now, Father, save people in this place. In Jesus' name I pray. Heads bowed, eyes closed, nobody looking around. You say, Pastor, you really believe that Jesus is coming back? Yeah. When do you think he's coming back? It could be before the end of the day. Oh, Pastor, you're just saying that to scare us. No. There's nothing from a biblical perspective, really, that Jesus would betray if he decided to come back today. The question is, are you ready? Are you ready to meet God? Listen, I'll tell you something else. It may not be Jesus coming back. You can step off a curb in downtown Visalia and a car take you out. You could be like me five years ago, 100% of the Widowmaker artery blocked in your body and you didn't know it. And your life could end today. The question is, are you ready? Are you ready to meet God? If you're not, pray with me right now. If you're not, just ask Jesus into your heart. Not out of fear. Say, Lord, I just want to live with you forever. I, I want you to take away my sins here. Lord, I, I just, I need something in my life that I presently don't have. If that's you, just lift up your hands and Pastor, pray for me. That's me. Yeah, I see you. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Up at the risers, bless you, thank you. Over here, my left, right, center, every section, there's hands being raised all across this place. I want everybody to pray, but if you raise your hand, keep it raised as we pray together. Pray this out loud with me. Everybody in this room, saved, unsaved, doesn't matter, backslidden, lukewarm, just pray it out loud. Heavenly Father, I come to you in Jesus' name. And I believe, I believe that you are who you say you are. I believe that you're coming back and I wanna be ready. Come into my heart, forgive me of my sins. Make me a new creation and I will live for you forever, forever and ever. In Jesus' name I pray. And everybody said, amen. Let's give the Lord a hand.